Uh, so well, welcome everybody uh, to our evening discussion of The Thing. My name is Bridget Keown. I'm a lecturer in the Gender, Sexuality and Women's Studies program at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, I'm a historian by training. Um, and as such, when I come to horror um, in some of my, my research and analysis, one of the questions that I really like to ask is why a particular thing is scary. What is it tapping into in our cultural memory, in our psyche, um, that is actually triggering those feelings of fear and that sense of unease? Um, and I think the thing offers any number of uh, analyses for this um, in really wonderful and rich ways. But what I wanted to talk about today specifically um, is the ways in which it ties into themes of empire and imperialism, um, the ways in which the historic process of empire lends itself to feelings of unease and horror and increasing violence, um, and the ways in which we can understand this film on a number of levels after we kind of do some a little bit of groundwork into some of the history and theories of modern imperialism. Uh, so those are some of the things we're going to be looking at today, um, and I am really eager to talk about them with you. So let us get started. Okay, so just to, to kind of lay the foundations, when we talk about imperialism, uh, we are talking about a policy of extending political and economic power to spaces outside of one's own natural borders. Um, usually this starts off as kind of a capitalistic enterprise, whether it is going to different places to gather resources to make new products or going and trying to open up new markets for products that one already has to sell. Um, but very quickly, it goes from kind of a, a cut and dry economic exchange to being something much deeper and something much more personal. And that shift is a really important moment for considering the way emotions play into this and knowledge and power and things like that. So when we look at the history of empire, we're talking about um, the use of hard power, so as in um, military action and soft power, which includes things like culture, the ways in which foreign powers are portrayed, often the way religion or history is interpreted. And these are the things that really kind of grab the psyche and grab the emotions. And it's these social and cultural forms of power that are really critical to our thinking about imperialism in terms of narrative. Um, what we also um, can think about is the ways in which imperialism preys on and fosters imagined and embodied superiority over another place and its people. So very often in the course of uh, histories of empires, we see colonial settlers thinking that they have an advantage, being told from a very early age that they are superior, whether through evolution or religious faith or a capitalist enterprise, and that it is therefore their right to go out and find these other places and quote unquote, settle them or make them in their image. And this assumed hierarchy is both in itself uniquely destructive and also is going to lead to a really profound moment of culture shock that we're going to be talking about um, a lot more as this as this talk goes forward. It's also a deeply gendered enterprise. Uh, women very much have a role to play in imperial projects, um, but when we kind of think of that initial contact, that initial period of enforcing power, opening markets, building businesses, this is very much historically the work of men. And I think that is mirrored very well in the thing where we see a station full of men and really the only voice of a woman that we hear is Adrienne Barbeau's in the form of the chess machine um, who has one or two lines. Um, and it's also very nostalgic. It is, imperialism is constantly looking back to some kind of imagined past as well as some kind of imagined future to sustain itself. Um, and I think the soundtrack from the thing, especially Ennio Morricone's more instrumental pieces, really heighten that and really involve deep emotions of memory and sensory expectations in ways that we can keep talking about again throughout, throughout our time together. But I think 
these ideas are all really critical um, towards advancing our understanding of empire, not only as a physical institution, but as an emotional and a psychological one as well. So I want to think about some of the ways in which empire works on the ground in real life um, and think about how that is going to apply to uh, the film that we are here to discuss today. So imperialism is very much ecological. Um, when we look at the acts of settlers, we see a real emphasis being put on place and order. Um, and we see environmental manipulation itself as a form of control. And we see that in not only the, the landscape of empire, but in living spaces as well. Uh, so we see empire as a, um, often take the form of logging, of deforestation, of planting crops, things like that in ways that are going to fundamentally change the landscape of a space. But also that colonists are really eager to control their lived experiences so that houses or other places of residence and interpersonal relationships are going to be made to look in the image of one's home country. Um, and I have a few examples to kind of show you as well as we move forward, but thinking about the ways in which we create home in a foreign place, I think is really important and also is going to add to that level of culture shock where what you see behind closed doors in the landscape that you're creating is vastly different than the world outside. And that tension between the two spaces can be really profound. Also thinking of environmental manipulation as a form of destruction, as a form of violence um, that is often used to fund or improve chances for imperial expansion. We're gonna look at some examples of that very shortly, um, but the ways in which um, domination of the landscape leads to and contributes to domination of people and of their culture is really important to think about as well. Um, and finally, the importance of scientific research to imperial practices. Um, this comes in the form of botanists who travel to look at plant life in jungles, or anthropologists who travel to understand different societies, archeologists who look to dig beneath the ground to find things. But so many fields of science are premised on this study of foreign places, foreign peoples, um, and that that means of knowledge, that collection of knowledge, and that possession of information is in itself a form of power. That the idea that one can know a place is integral to being able to feel like one has dominated it. Um, but that access to knowledge can itself be a real danger. And we'll, we'll again be talking about that as we get closer to the film. Here are just some, some images from um, a few different colonial uh, texts that show the ways in which colonial settlers are really emphasizing home in their residences, despite the fact of uh, indigenous peoples working in their houses, despite the climates outside, things like that. So on my left-hand side, you can see a French woman um, in French Indochina and uh, in Southeast Asia who is putting on her very European gown, this very white, uh, clean dress while she is being tended to by um, her native servants. We can see a parrot there, which is very much indicative of the tropical climate in which she's living and is probably not dressed very well for. Um, and on the right-hand side is from a, a British book where we see a family who is resolutely, again, sticking to their form of dress, um, despite the fact that they are in India, um, that their diet is not suited to the climate in which they find themselves. Um, again, that there are these interactions with people that are not typical in a British setting, um, but that are being incorporated into this space that is made to feel exceptionally British and perhaps made to feel even more so because of this distance from home that we are going to be emphasizing this. Um, and we're, we can see this in Outpost 31, not only with um, the advertisements and the posters on the wall and the clothing that people are wearing, but also how they choose to spend their time when they are not engaged with dealing with the thing. And we'll explore what that means uh, going forward. This is just another example of the ways in which environmental manipulation and destruction contributes to the building of empire. So this is a graph showing old growth forests 
um, and unceded indigenous land in what is now the continental United States. Um, and looking at that moment of first contact in 1620, the amount of old growth forests that in some ways were kind of sheltering these unceded lands. Um, and as deforestation continued moving from east to west, we see that it enables not only um, you know, the logging industry to, to go forward, construction to go forward, but also the exposure of those unceded indigenous lands to uh, imperial scrutiny and imperial domination as well. So this is a, a landscape that is personal, but also deeply physical when we think about the landscape and those two are inextricably intertwined. Map making is also a crucial aspect of the imperial project. Uh, whether that is the ability to uh, map a coastline, to see where places are safe to land a vessel or to grow crops, to note where people are living, um, to color in spaces on a map to reflect your ownership there, or whether it is being able to plant a sign that says this territory belongs to the United States in Antarctica um, and is being used as a research station that these are other forms of knowledge that serve incredibly powerful purposes for the uh, process of building an empire. One of the other things that goes along with this is the ease of travel and communication as a form of power. If one can access a space, if one is able to uh, penetrate past a coastline in one's investigations, one has much easier time being able to access um, or to, to build supply lines further into a place. Um, we see this, especially in the thing as radio signals are cut down, as our group's ability to leave their space gets increasingly diminished. And the paranoia and the fear that that itself creates within the story, I think is really profound. Um, and we begin to realize how much the ability to come and go as one pleases is in itself a form of power. And this leads us to kind of focus on Antarctica itself as a, a critical aspect of the Imperial project. Um, Antarctica itself has very few resources um, that are at least easily accessible. Um, there are no natural inhabitants there who are human. Um, and for both these reasons, Antarctica has posed kind of a, a fascinating challenge within the history of empire. And we see it come up, especially during times of imperialist violence, that the narrative around Australia, uh, Antarctica rather, sorry, and the scrutiny on the Antarctic continent becomes increasingly obvious. Um, and this is because as the process of empire building goes on, Antarctica is the last place left on the map that has not either been claimed or is doing the claiming. And so it remains kind of this mythical place that is remains open for imperial claims if anyone is able to actually go there and establish some kind of base camp for any long period of time. But then the question is, what would one do there? Um, and the narratives of exploration throughout Antarctic history, I think really indicate the ways in which it is part of this imperial project and this imperial history. So if we look through um, kind of the history of exploration in Antarctica, um, we see that since about 1800, there have been 300 expeditions and that each of these has a narrative of claiming, of reclaiming, um, whether it is the first Russian expedition to actually see Antarctica, um, the first uh, seal hunters and whale hunters who first landed on Antarctica and placed their feet there, whether it is um, the first expedition to plant flags there, whether it is the first people to traverse Antarctica, that each expedition is looking to add to this narrative to be the first person to do something there, to lay claim to this continent in a profound way that stakes ownership on some level. Um, and is implicitly kind of adding to this narrative of discovery and of claim making. And we see these expeditions and this focus on Antarctica, at a, as I said, during times, especially of imperial conflict. Uh, so probably in modern history, one of the, the most well-known stories is that of Ernest Shackleton, 
uh, which took place during the First World War. Um, Shackleton himself was thinking of calling off his expedition when the First World War began in 1914 and was told by the British government that this expedition itself could be critical to morale, especially on the home front. That narratives of discovery and of global conquest were just what the reading public needed to keep them fighting through this increasingly stressful and violent war. Now the expedition did not go off as people expected. Um, Shackleton did get in his ship, got trapped in the ice um, and had to make a extraordinarily harrowing journey to go get help. Um, but the ways in which the media attention on Shackleton and on his trip, especially when he first left, uh, was, was so upbeat, was so enthusiastic, I think really points to the importance of this journey as a morale booster. Um, during the Second World War, again, we begin focusing on Antarctica as a place possibly to land naval ships, um, as a place for um, refueling, and also possibly as a base for sending out atomic weapons. Um, this discussion begins towards the end of the Second World War, and in 1946, 47, 48, we see the US um, initiating operations high jump and windmill, um, which are both mapping um, operations that are looking to make detailed maps of Antarctica, where it might be safe to station a naval ship or build a small base, and also to investigate the possibility of launching nuclear weapons from Antarctica to other places in the globe, extending US uh, armament reach during what is becoming the Cold War. Um, and on the left-hand side of the slide, you can actually see um, a photo taken from Operation Windmill uh, showing a helicopter kind of doing scouting missions over Antarctica. And this fear especially that Antarctica could be used as a site of naval warfare um, and the use of this continent as a place for nuclear weaponry led to the declaration um, of Antarctica effectively as a neutral military zone. So the Antarctic Treaty of 1959, which was enacted in 1961, um, officially declares Antarctica um, forever, quote unquote, to be used exclusively for peaceful purposes. Um, and that it is a site of scientific research um, that different countries can claim interests there, but it cannot be used as a site of um, warmongering, of violence, or as anything other than environmental protection and scientific exploration. But even in doing that, we see that different countries have laid claim to certain parts of Antarctica as a site of observation um, and as a site of building bases for exploration there. Um, so in itself, even as these treaties are seeking to minimize the imperialist impact in Antarctica, it still is a place where we can lay claim. It still is a place where we can have a sphere of influence. And that imperial narrative is ongoing even today. Um, in ways that, that I think makes the story of Arctic and Antarctic exploration that much more imperative is that it is an ongoing one. Um, even as much as a part of Cold War policy, it is still an issue, especially in our environmentally precarious world today. So what is it that makes imperialism so rife for narratives of terror? Uh, and I think when we think about this, it's really important to think about those moments of culture shock. If we think back to the ways in which imperial settlers are told that they have a right to go to other places, to conquer other sites, to claim them for their own, and to have environmental dominion over them, it can be incredibly jarring to arrive in a place and find that you are not wanted, to find that your dominion is not welcome, and to find people and landscapes that are both incredibly hostile to the practice of setting up an imperial base. And that this tension and this culture shock is both extraordinarily profound and can be truly terrifying, especially for the colonial settler who was coming over thinking this is going to be easy. And as we see those initial contacts with people who don't look like our settlers, who don't speak the same language, whose faith is completely different, whose gendered systems of interactions are completely foreign to what these settlers have known, that they themselves begin questioning their own place in this hierarchy, their own right to these places, and very often doubling down. And we see that this shock and this 
profound sense of displacement often leads to increasing violence. And we'll talk about that in just a second. Um, several texts kind of deal with this horror extraordinarily well. Um, one of which is Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness. Um, Conrad himself served aboard numerous um, ships that went into Africa. He himself saw firsthand the ways in which um, African colonization corrupted those um, who were in power there. Um, and he writes about this moment of first contact in a way that, that shows not only the ways in which fear breeds racism, but also the profound sense of identity that, or crisis of identity that settlers suffer. So he writes, uh, quote, it was unearthly and the men, meaning the men that are encountered there um, in Africa were, no, they were not inhuman. Well, you know, that was the worst of it. The suspicion of their not being inhuman. It would come slowly to one. They howled and leaped and spun and made horrid faces. But what thrilled you was just the thought of their humanity, like yours. The thought of your remote kinship with this wild and passionate uproar. And we see this, this tension born of it, a desire to see foreign peoples as completely other, as not related to us, and indeed submissive to us, and realizing this is not the case. And the fear and the reactions that causes can often be terrible in themselves. We also frequently see empire narratives as, quote, sites of madness. Um, I think Conrad kind of deals with that very well, but in numerous narratives of empire talk about um, the difficulties of existing in a space that is so foreign to one. Um, we very often see um, imperial spaces described as places without a past, that they are places where um, people, quote unquote, have not lived, uh, which implicitly shows um, a lack of understanding indigenous history and the way stories are told. Um, and we also see empires as sites of incredible boredom that very often people who are there are sitting around waiting for something to happen. And that the fear of not knowing what's coming next can be really trying for one, especially if there's nothing for you to do. Um, we see that this process of violence, when it does happen, um, as both sides of this imperial tension kind of look to either claim control or reclaim control over an area, leads to increasing cycles of violence that are often take place in perpetuity. Um, we see this enacted during the First and Second World Wars, um, the Cold War, Vietnam, that all of these um, battles are in some way fought over control of imperial sites and lead to increasing cycles of violence that often escalate beyond the control of any of the participants. And the inevitable end of these narratives is very often either madness, self-destruction, or total apocalypse of a site. Um, we're gonna look at that through the lens of the thing very shortly. But I think it's very telling that very early on in the film, uh, we have Nalls emphasizing that five minutes is enough to put a man over down here. And that, that that line between complacency and total madness is a very thin one when you are in a site that you don't understand. Um, and thinking about that in the context of this film, I think helps us get to the heart of, of what makes the thing so terrifying. I think it's also really important to understand that for the indigenous peoples who are native to the lands that are being uh, colonized or being made into sites of empire, that imperialism itself is a tool of violence um, that isolates people from their communities, indeed from their selves, from their own sense of purpose or identity or of belonging to a site um, and from their natural environments. And this is done both through the destruction of buildings or communities, as well as through the perpetration of contagions. Um, we know in the United States specifically that um, smallpox was responsible for killing 85 to 90% of the indigenous peoples living in North America, um, not only because they had not been exposed to the virus before, but also because on a haplotype level that they were potentially biologically different and thus were more highly susceptible to this disease than Europeans were. We also see that the plants and the crops that Europeans are bringing, which have been cultivated on small 
farms, which have learned over time that they needed to be more competitive in order to survive, are much better suited for fighting plants and crops that have grown in naturally in North America up to this time. And that the crops that settlers are planting themselves act as kind of a contagious disease that is taking over the landscape and pushing out plants that have been indigenous to this area as well. And we see these sites of empire again become places of reclamation or revolution that becomes an enduring cycle of violence. That it may start off, as we said, with hard power, um, using military tactics and very um, obvious forms of violence that then become encoded in laws, that can be encoded in speech and culture in a way that perpetuates this violence, even if it is not being performed directly. Um, and Rebecca Rowanhorst has written an article for Uncanny Magazine where she kind of addresses this process and talks about um, the sci-fi and the horror genres always focusing on contagion or zombie invasions and saying that for indigenous peoples and sites of empire, that has already happened and that the uh, imperialists themselves represent those contagions and those zombies that so terrorize us in, in Western stories of horror. Um, and one of the quotes from her text is here at the bottom of this slide and said, what if I told you that there had been a zombie apocalypse? What if I told you that you were the zombies? And I think this, this quote, this piece um, really helps us think about um, indigenous lands themselves as sites of horror when we talk about the process of imperialism. Um, and we see on the, the left-hand side of the slide, just so you understand. So, um, most of the corn that is grown in North America today was not indigenous to the area that it was brought over um, by settlers and managed to um, wipe out indigenous forms of grain that had been grown here. Um, we see archaeological digs causing massive widespread destruction in sites um, of empire. Um, and also on the bottom of the slide is um, an illustration about the spread of smallpox among indigenous communities as well. So all of these um, are forms of invasion narratives that are uh, sustained by indigenous peoples during the process of empire. So having laid that foundation, let's think about the thing as a site of empire and imperialism. Um, so first of all, we're gonna think about Outpost 31 as a site of empire itself. We know that it's a place of scientific research. Uh, we know that it is constructed to house Americans who are doing work there. Uh, we don't know specifically what they're doing. And I think that is part of, um, that part itself is very important, that they are knowledge gatherers, but that their knowledge is not defined by any rules, that they are there simply to gather knowledge. Um, we also see that their rec room is filled with evidence of Western culture. Uh, we have pool tables, we have bar, uh, signs, we have pinup girl posters, all of these uh, kind of kitschy reminders that they are far from home and trying to create a space that is familiar to them. And again, we see this in the clothing they wear too. We also see, it, especially at the beginning of the movie, that boredom is the norm in this world um, and that people are consciously attacked attempting to alleviate the monotony of their lives in different ways. Uh, we see Nalls going about on roller skates for most of the beginning of the film, kind of as a, a way of, of ease of, of transport, but also as a form of entertainment. Uh, we see McCready's hat, which is certainly not something you would use to actually keep your head warm, but may differentiate you from your companions and the base might be a source of humor. Um, and we see that the desire for control often leads to more boredom. And I think this is shown uh, when McCready is playing chess with Adrian Barbeau, the chess machine, and she wins and he pours whiskey down her and she breaks. Um, so that the need to enforce control is in itself a tool of enforcing boredom. Um, and I think it's also important to realize how nondescript these characters are, especially at the beginning of the movie. Um, that they do all kind of look alike, their names are similar. And we see them to some extent trying to assert their individuality through these little quirks to kind of break up um, the boredom of their appearance and their interpersonal communications. Um, and we're, we're gonna play around with that idea as we go forward as well. 
Uh, as we talked about Western cultures as a form of entertainment here, um, whether it is watching game shows um, or playing video games or things like that, that whatever is kind of Western and homey to the members of Outpost 31, it is very um, pop culture that there is nothing profound in what they are building here, but it is an attempt to make it feel like home. We see the manipulation of their lived environment, whether it's through the construction of their outpost or the evidence they find at base Camp Thule, um, which is the, the Norwegian base that they visit uh, in the, towards the beginning of the movie. And base Camp Thule serves as kind of a cautionary tale for the worst impulses of imperial expansion, whether it's digging in the ice and going far deeper than you ever intended, um, or it is out and out destruction of a site in order to prevent this, this danger from spreading. Uh, but Base Camp Thule, when we are able to see it, is this burned out husk of a place that is warning about the hubris of empire building in strange places. Um, and what can happen when the quest, quest for knowledge exposes one to risks and harm and what has to be done uh, to rectify that. We also see the manipulation of the environment when they bring the corpse into base camp. And I think this itself is probably one of the most profound ways in which we can think about Outpost 31 as home. That if it is inside our walls, it is somehow rendered safe because it is our space. And that is profoundly not the case uh, once the corpse enters the building and we begin to see the thing able to propagate um, in the walls of this base camp. Um, and we see the way that this cycle of violence and destruction begins as soon as the thing is let loose, as soon as there is a power struggle going on within these spaces, that the ways in which violence escalates becomes extraordinarily profound. And finally, we have imperialism as a lack of communication, that this culture difference that is taking place both between the Americans at Outpost 31 and their lived environment and the people of Outpost 31 and those around them is extraordinarily problematic and that their resistance to changing or adapting to their circumstances in the end is their downfall. Uh, and I think this is highlighted really clearly during our first encounter with the Norwegians from Base Camp Thule um, who are pursuing the dog across the snow at the very beginning of the movie. Now, some of you who are longtime fans may uh, know this fact already, but again, just to emphasize the ways in which culture shock and a lack of communication between languages is so important to this movie, I wanna show you a clip of the encounter with the Norwegian with English subtitles at the bottom. Um, Cause I think it really drives home the fact that if we had multilingual people at Outpost 31, all of this could, could have been avoided. Uh, so let's just take a look. I think even in that small clip, there's so much that we can explore there. Um, but just in case the sound or the video didn't come through for you, um, that is Lars the Norwegian, um, who is pointing a gun at the members of Outpost 31 who have come out, and specifically at the dog whose real name is Jed, uh, who I think we, we need to point out is probably one of the best canine actors in cinematic history. Um, but what he is saying to them in Norwegian is, get the hell away. That's not a dog, it's some sort of thing. It's imitating a dog, it isn't real. Get away, you idiots. Um, and as we will find out, indeed, the thing is embodying Lar uh, Jed the dog and is about to wreak its havoc on Outpost 31. But their inability to communicate, first and foremost, condemns them. Um, and second of all, they're willing to meet this tension with violence. Um, also means that they can no longer communicate with Lars once they have killed him. Oops, sorry, there we go. I also think it's really important to think of Outpost 31, not just as a space where settlers are coming to colonize a place, but where there are settlers who are in the process of being colonized. And to understand that in many ways, the cast of the film themselves represent um, the horrors of imperialism as well. Um, so we learn very quickly that Outpost 31 is quote, a thousand miles from nowhere. 
um, that it is not a place that is easily, that one can leave easily or from which one can communicate easily. Um, and this is going to become increasingly difficult when the radio goes down and when their methods of conveyance are destroyed. When we encounter the thing, it is able to know the people around it enough so that it can actually assimilate and become um, utterly unrecognizable, that it can embody humans so well that one can't tell who is the thing and who is real. While it itself remains mysterious, that we are never able to fully know the thing, much in the same ways that imperial um, scientists who were knowledge gatherers could take things away from a site of empire without leaving anything back, uh, without actually trading knowledge, instead simply taking it. And that lack of knowledge indeed represents a powerlessness, that we see our characters constantly struggling to understand what is going on, to reclaim control over their knowledge, um, and ultimately failing. Um, and that their only defense comes from rendering their base camp um, as a, to destroying the information that they are keeping so that it cannot be corrupted by the thing. Um, so we see the destruction of their archives and their computers nominally so that um, it will make it impossible for them to communicate with the outside, that there will not be a rescue attempt mounted but also that it is rendering them effectively powerless. Um, and the way that knowledge is manipulated throughout the film, I think is a really critical thing to think about. It's also important, I think, to think of the thing itself as a form of contagion. Uh, we know that it is transferred from the dog to the members of camp. Um, it is also transferred through um, contact or through fluids or things like that. And very often uh, we see criticism or critique of this film as a narrative of uh, the outbreak of HIV. And while I think there is certainly an interpretation that is important here of that, um, I, I do think it's also from a historical standpoint important to realize that um, it was only established that HIV could be transferred through blood products around 1982, 83. Um, so, the ways in which we are talking about blood and contagion in this film, I think relates far more to this long history of imperialism, of determining who is fit to rule and who is fit to be ruled through measuring blood. Um, and the ways in which imperial contagion often rendered uh, indigenous people much weaker. Um, when humans become assimilated, they become spectacles, that they become dehumanized in really critical ways, highly visible ways, obviously, but also in the sense that they have been lost to the rest of their community. And this plays on a, a very deep um, narrative of empire where settlers would come and take religious artifacts, um, put individuals or their culture on display in museums, as part of medical and scientific textbooks and dehumanize them through this, through making them a spectacle. And that is apparently what the thing is doing to those people um, that it infiltrates and attempts to assimilate. And we see that the thing is able to manipulate its environment as well as the bodies of those it corrupts. Um, so especially at the end of the film when it's borrowing underneath the foundations of Outpost 31, we see the ways in which it can manipulate the lived environment as well as the bodies around it in a way that emphasizes its profound power in this space over that of the humans who are fighting it. And I think just before we move on, it's also important to think about the ways in which it is corrupting an environment that has previously been known. Um, one of the things that I find remarkable about this film is as it progresses and as things get more and more dire, we increasingly see shots that are traveling through this outpost and that our knowledge that there is something more powerful than our heroes out there that could be anywhere at any time renders our viewing of this outpost as increasingly dangerous, as a place that where danger might be lurking at any turn. And it divorces us from our knowledge of this space in, in really profound ways um, that I think really emphasize how the thing is a site of in, as an invader and as a corruptor. 
And ultimately, we see the practice of othering, which takes place um, in imperial narratives very frequently. Um, so when we talk about othering, we're talking about a process that is very often discussed in um, sites of empire and things like that, where we identify other people, not by their uh, notable positive characteristics or through their familiarity to us, but by choosing to talk about those things which we find vile, which we find dishonorable, or emphasizing their differences from us in a way that emphasizes that difference is wrong. Um, and we see that being done when the members of Outpost 31 encounter the Norwegians, or as they insist on calling them, the Swedes, because they cannot tell the difference between the two of them, um, and denigrate them as something different to them, but also the ways in which the thing itself comes in and renders the members of Outpost 31 as other to each other as well um, in its corruption. And it weighs, the ways it renders these individuals kind of unworthy of their humanity. And we go from this um, kind of nondescript group of men um, whose you know, clothing all looks the same, whose cold weather jackets and things obscure a lot of their faces. Um, we are in a party of all mostly white men, mostly bearded men whose names are all very familiar and that they're being comfort in that to suddenly being unable to differentiate people as a source of fear and the ways in which the thing has corrupted our knowledge of each other here. Um, and I think this is driven home really profoundly when McCready is making his voice recording and talking about the undershirt that he has found and says, the name tag was missing. They could be anybody's referring to the clothes, but suddenly that, that sameness has become in itself a danger because the thing has corrupted everything around it. So I think when we, when we talk about the thing, when we start thinking about why specifically it is so scary, I think considering this film within a very long narrative of empire um, and thinking about the warnings it is given both to um, those who would be imperializers and the ways in which it reflects the horror of indigenous peoples makes this a really, really profound film. So we see warnings about the ultimate failure of any imperial endeavor, that no place can ultimately be known, that there is no way to fully claim power over a space, that there is always room for danger, for corruption and for loss of control. It also emphasizes to us the terror of being colonized, whether that is territorially or bodily. Um, and is enacting upon colonizers the very harm that was performed by them on indigenous peoples. And that that return of violence is in itself terrifying. And then it ends with an unending cycle of horror, that there's always the potential, even after the base has been destroyed, even after the party and the outposts are mostly dead, that this thing could just be hibernating, that there is no guarantee it is gone or ever will be gone. And that perpetual threat, again, is this embodiment of uncertainty in the text and also in our history of imperialism that is profoundly and deeply unsettling because of the ways it is pulling on these very deep narratives um, of culture shock and control. So I hope you've enjoyed. I truly appreciate you sitting and listening and working through these ideas with me. Um, and if you're looking for some further exploration or exploration into the world of Arctic horror or imperialism linked to horror, here are just a, a few recommendations for you. Um, whether it's an anthology of um, horror stories pulled by indigenous peoples, um, there's the White Vault podcast, which is amazing, um, and some other um, scholarly and fictional works as well, um, just to keep your search for Arctic and Antarctic car going. So thank you so much.